Hello everyone, welcome to Classroom 2.0 Live for Saturday, February 24th. Our special guest today is Trevor McKenzie and his topic is Dive into Inquiry. Your co-moderators are Peggy George, I'm Lori Moffat, Tammy Moore, and Paula Noggle. Thanks to Tammy for doing closed captioning for us. And I'm going to turn the mic over to Peggy who will now introduce Trevor and ask him the newbie question. Well, hello, everyone. Thank you all for joining us. We are so excited to have Trevor McKenzie with us today to share his passion for inquiry-based learning and the tremendous impact it can have as we work with our own students. And it was so exciting to see that so many of you, in fact, almost all of you, I think, are familiar with inquiry-based learning and are using it. That's Awesome. Trevor is an award-winning English teacher at Oak Bay High School in Victoria, British Columbia, Canada. He's also an instructional coach, and he focuses on inquiry and technology integration. And he's a graduate student who believes, and I just love this about him, that it is a magical time to be an educator. It really is. He's working towards his MA in Curriculum and Instruction at the University of Victoria, and he's researching the impact of an inquiry-based teaching model on learner self-efficacy. And he believes, and I'm sure his research is going to show this, by increasing student agency over learning, weaving in strong pedagogy, transformative tech use, and shared learning to a public audience, his learners are ready to take on the important roles in the 21st century. He uses technology to enhance his teaching as he experiments with the flipped classroom, inquiry-based learning, iPad Ed, and exploring student blogging as a means to reflect on learning. He strives to make learning public and meaningful and to support innovation and connection amongst educators. Trevor is the author of Dive Into Inquiry and a new book that's just about to come out that he'll be telling us about called Inquiry Mindset, Nurturing the Dreams, Wonders, and Curiosities of Our Youngest Learners, which he's co-authored with Rebecca Bathurst Hunt. And it should be out this next month. We're really looking forward to it. And it's published by the EdTech Team Press. Also, just want to remind everyone, be sure to explore our live binder after the webinar because you'll find lots of great resources and videos to support your learning about inquiry-based learning. So welcome, Trevor. Thank you so much for sharing with us today. And to get things started, we'd like to ask you our newbie question. And after you've answered that, you can take over the slides and begin your presentation. So here's our newbie question. How is inquiry-based learning different than student research projects? Thank you so much, Peggy. And, and I want to say thank you as well to Lori and Tammy and Paula for hosting me and, uh, and for everyone for joining us on a Saturday, wherever you are around the world. I appreciate you joining us. And I truly believe that we are better together in learning and in collaboration. So when we have opportunities like this to learn from one another and to collaborate, uh, I just get really excited. And so uh, I appreciate the invitation and I appreciate you all joining us today on on this Saturday, wherever you are located. I love this newbie question. It's so neat. And what a great way for us to kick off our time together. Um, for me, inquiry-based learning is really quite different than student research projects. Uh, being an Eng English teacher, I do believe in the power of words and that words have particular meanings and connotations and hold weight in how we choose to use them and how we add them to our vocabulary and, and how we are explicit and intentional with using those words with our students and with our colleagues. So for me, a research project has this finite endpoint um, and, and inquiry is more of a holistic, lifelong learning approach to the classroom, but obviously it, it, it's a thread that ties everything that goes on outside of school 
and brings it within the school. Um, and for me, student research projects, I always tell my students and my colleagues that, you know, if I see my students recycle the contents of their binder at the end of the year, at the end of a, a unit of study, I, I don't feel like I've done my job. You know, good, good learning doesn't get tossed into the, the waste bin at the end of a unit or at the end of the year. And I have many stories where inquiry, uh, learning transcends the bell schedule and transcends our time together and, and quite literally transcends after high school ends and students graduate and move on into uh, their future endeavors. They're still exploring these interests and these curiosities and their passions. And, and I should say, at least if I've done my job powerfully and properly, uh, inquiry transcends what I, I would perceive uh, research projects do. And so uh, this hour, I love the newbie question, this hour uh, is going to go by fast. Uh, it is going to be interactive. I'm going to ask you as, as you returning uh, friends of Classroom 2.0 Live know to please join the chat. I will definitely prompt you throughout this session to share your ideas so we can all learn from the power of the, the, the tribe here. Um, and definitely the moderators, I'll, I'll tee up a few questions for you as well that uh, you, maybe if you feel comfortable jumping on the mic, you, you could do so. Um, just as an introductory slide, these are my online spaces where you can reach out and, and chat with me or collaborate with me. I'm very active on Twitter. Um, I just feel like the power of the, the, the PLN is immense. And um, please reach out to me. Uh, I love when teachers share what's happening in their classroom or in their practice. Uh, so whether it's a photo or, or a, you know, some anecdotal description of inquiry in your room, um, please reach out. Uh, you know, I've got a strong following on Twitter and I love to retweet ideas to inspire other educators to give inquiry a go. Um, you know, I'm on Instagram, of course, and then there's my online uh, website. There's my online space, TrevorMcKenzie.com. You know, my blog is really robust. I blog weekly. Uh, I have a weekly blog on Mondays that I push out all about provocations. We'll talk about provocations later. Uh, and that weekly provocation on my blog is called Meaningful Monday. So I'll talk about Meaningful Monday a little bit later. But go to trevormckenzie.com. Not only will you see resources and sketch notes, but you'll also see information about the two books. So um, thanks for the lovely introduction, Peggy. Uh, I am the author of Dive in Inquiry, Amplify Learning, and Empower Student Voice. It's been in print for almost two years, and, and I've been really blessed with the response that it's gotten. Uh, I think it's gotten a great response from teachers and, and coaches and administrators because it's uh, written by a teacher for teachers. It really is a voice that is accessible, and uh, from a perspective of making sense of this oftentimes nebulous idea of inquiry and making it sense, uh, make sense of, uh, for teachers as, as to what it looks like in the classroom day in and day out. Um, you know, I do a lot of travel, a lot of speaking. I am a full-time teacher in the classroom, so as you can imagine, I, I take some relief time, I take some, some weekends away from my family to go and share my expertise with other teachers. And um, an inquiry mindset, nurturing the dreams, wonders, cur and curiosities of our youngest learners really did surface out of my travels over the last couple of years and realizing that teachers, especially at the younger years, needed uh, those, those case studies, those examples, those artifacts that we use with our youngest learners to spark curiosity and under their one, honor their wonders and questions. So inquiry mindset, although it's for all educators, it's really with a specific lens on K to 7. So if you're an elementary school teacher or teach younger students, inquiry mindset's going to be out uh, early March. Um, find it at trevormckenzie.com. It's going to be live on Amazon and live on EdTech Team Press as well. Um, and then last, of course, the hashtag for Live Class 20, uh, a vibrant conversation going on week to week of teachers from around the world sharing ideas. Uh, so please check out that as well. Uh, yes, lots of terrific resources here. And, and please reach out as you unpack some of these online spaces and resources with any questions that you may have. Just a little bit of background on me. This is my high school. This is Oak Bay High School in the Greater Victoria School District. Our school is about 1,400 students. And my class is the second floor. It's about the fourth window over from the right on that second floor. It's a beautiful building. I live in the neighborhood in which I teach. It's a miraculous thing being able to see your students uh, at the grocery store or at the beach or in the swimming pool. They are lifeguards to some of my, to my children. Um, this is the main corridor into our school. There's a big theme of transparency in our building. Uh, a lot of natural light and a lot of collaborative spaces. 
This is called the social stair. Uh, you know, teachers can book this space to collaborate with students and, and do uh, group activities. It really is the social hub of our school. Um, and then last, this is our theater. It's a beautiful theater. We have a strong uh, theater program. We actually are, our musical theater production this year is about to kick off. I'm really excited to see it. I uh, have a lot of students who have been working, you know, tirelessly on making this production a success. Uh, so that's a little bit of me. Everything I propose, everything I'll share with you today, this is, these are ideas that I, I, I use in my classroom. Um, inquiry for me really has surfaced from the needs I've witnessed over my career from my students. So the structures I propose, uh, the processes I propose and that we'll talk about today and I'll get you to reflect on today have all surfaced from my experience as a classroom teacher and of course leading into my graduate studies now I'm looking for the research behind all the successes I've witnessed and all the gut feelings I've had from, from uh, you know, the power of inquiry. I'm trying to back up in my research right now. So it's an exciting time for me and it's, an, and it's an exciting time to be an educator, you know, being globally connected as we are to be able to learn from one another. It really is a beautiful thing. Um, we're going to start with this sketch note and, and I'm going to, you know, kind of preface the sketch note and uh, prompt you to, you know, share some ideas in the chat. Um, and maybe I'll call on some of the moderators shortly to share an idea from the sketch note as well. Um, this is a sketch note from Sylvia Duckworth. There's her Twitter handle at the top. If you're not familiar with Sylvia's work, she's a retired French immersion teacher. Um, but she's most notably recognized for her sketch noting. And sketch noting, of course, is this idea of taking a, a big idea in education and bringing it to life through the power of imagery. And she does a beautiful job doing so. You know, if you, she's got a book with EdTech Team Press as well. Um, if you find her on Twitter, you'll, you'll see her sketch notes. Um, and she reached out to me just after diving the inquiry what went to print and she asked me if we can collaborate on a top 10 reasons to use inquiry-based learning together. And um, it was a great partnership, great collaboration. Uh, and how I use this with staff and with teachers and educators is, I use it as a reflective tool. If these are the characteristics that inquiry-based learning classes possess, I ask teachers to recognize and reflect and recognize a few of these that currently would surface in their practice. You know, if I were to come and observe you teach, and I, if, I, if you're kind enough to invite me to your class, which of these would I see surface in a week of your teaching and, and learning that happens in your room? And in recognizing that already without any deeper learning or research or adoption of inquiry, already there are elements of inquiry in your classroom. I think that really honors the teacher uh, and, and doesn't, you know, finger point, doesn't suggest that they have to take on something entirely new or different in their practice. It really honors that we all are doing our best with regards to personalized learning and, and supporting our students with having more agency over learning. But the flip side of that, of course, is we don't just want to recognize the things that we're currently doing that are amazing. We also want to recognize a few things that we could do to elevate inquiry in our practice and maybe sharpen a few of these areas and hone them a bit. So what I'd like to do now in the chat is ask you to recognize maybe one or two that currently are a part of your classroom that you know you touch down on. And what would really be helpful to the chat is if you can share an example of uh, what we would, would witness uh, and recognize in your classroom uh, for each element you share. So I'll, I'll honor this first. I'll, I'll model, and if you could share in the chat, I, I'd love it. You know, number eight is is a big piece of my practice, fortifying the importance of asking good questions. I do believe that number eight is a hallmark of the inquiry classroom. You know, questions that start learning as opposed to a textbook or as opposed to a test or a diagnostic. When we begin learning with a question, uh, I think inquiry inevitably is, is more powerful. Um, and, and how I fortify the importance of these questions, I'm very mindful and intentional of getting my students to not just ask questions and honor those questions, but having them become stronger question creators. Uh, I love the right question technique. Uh, I love Make Just One Change by Dan Rothstein and Luz Santana. That's a, that's a fantastic resource that really impacted my inquiry practice. And so that's a, that's a really mindful and intentional uh, resource and, and direction I take with my students to make sure that number eight happens in my classroom. So that's what, exactly what I would share in the chat. I would say number eight happens in my practice and I use the right question technique uh, in my practice to fortify the importance of asking good questions. 
And I'm sure what's going to happen in the chat is as we share, we're all going to learn and pick up ideas from one another as to either reaffirming what we currently do or ideas of how we could elevate something that perhaps we don't quite touch down on uh, as, as often as, as others. Um, I'd love to call on moderators. Maybe, uh, Peggy, maybe I'll pick on you first. Looking at this uh, and reflecting on your, your career as an educator, uh, which ones of these uh, have surfaced throughout your experience with students? Would you mind sharing an example with us? Well, how can I type in the chat and talk at the same time? <laughs> sure, I, I can do that. I just think um, uh, so many of those are important, but I put in the chat that um, I really think that curiosity and wonder are so important for learning. Because if you don't start with that and start by asking them, what are they curious about? What do they wonder about? You don't get it from the student perspective. And that's where the passion is going to come from. And I know you're going to be talking about that. But I think that's important for university students as well as for elementary, middle school, and high school students. And that's when they'll be able to take ownership over their own learning when they can start from that point of view. Brilliant. Thank you so much for sharing. And just an example of what we could do to foster curiosity and a, and a love for learning. Um, I want to share one example from Inquiry Mindset. This is something you're getting some exclusive content here, folks, to just create some hype. But um, uh, we write about what we call the curiosity jar. And the curiosity jar, uh, in a lot of classrooms, it's a big mason jar. And, and the class decorates the mason jar to make it look beautiful. And, and intriguing and exciting, and the curiosity jar sits in the classroom in a really visible space, an accessible space, location, and, and the class, students are invited to write down a curiosity or a wondering and pop it into the curiosity jar at any time throughout the school day. And the obligation of the teacher is to use those curiosities uh, in their lesson planning and in their partnership with their learners. And so, we see teachers uh, pull the curiosity jar to carpet time, for example, and of course the teacher has sifted through these curiosities beforehand to help them prepare for what could happen at carpet time, right? We never want to pull the curiosity jar to carpet time and just randomly pull out curiosities. We want to be really mindful and intentional of recognizing where these curiosities can be uh, leveraged to create really amazing learning opportunities. So, you know, uh, a teacher will pull out a curiosity and, of course, imagine the excitement from the student when their curiosity is read aloud and when all of their curiosities are read aloud. And sometimes the teacher will, uh, you know, on the projector model, maybe using YouTube or maybe finding another site that is rich in answering or addressing the curiosity. So the students, imagine grade twos, imagine grade three seeing this digital literacy in action where the teacher is recognizing the curiosity and then showing how to research the curiosity in real time. You know, another way that students uh, could see that their curiosities matter here in the curiosity jar is the teacher can ask the class, does anyone know something about this curiosity? And we all have those experts in our classroom. We all have a student who knows a lot about a specific topic. And when they're honored in sharing their prior knowledge with the class, that really is exciting for them and increases engagement, of course. Um, sometimes we ask students, does anyone have a parent who knows something about this curiosity? And then, of course, that invites parents in to be a part of this learning opportunity and this learning moment. Um, sometimes we push the curiosity jar to our librarians, our library media specialists. And we ask them to design or, or, or create a lesson or a visit uh, to the library where those curiosities could be honored. Sometimes it's the librarian pulls books off the shelves in the library and lays them on tables. And students are tasked with going and discovering a book that matches their curiosity. Um, it's, it really is an amazing, amazing uh, artifact, the curiosity jar, and it can be used in many ways. My son is in grade three this year, and last year as a grade two, his curiosity was pulled out, and the teacher had seen that the curiosity was actually connected to a unit of study in science that they were planning on doing in a month, and he made it appear that my son's curiosity 
actually inspired him to create this unit of study, which was so meaningful for my son to see that not only does his curiosity matter, but that it could shape a learning uh, experience in school. And I think that's really, really important. How do we foster curiosity and love for learning? The curiosity jar is one example of how we can do so. I'd love to hear from one more moderator, if it's possible. Um, I, and I don't want to pick on anyone specific, but Lori, Tammy, or Paula, whoever would like to jump on first and share with us an example of something that's, uh, you know, surfaced in your educational career and, and how we know it's there. Would someone like to jump on for us? Oh, I see. Tammy's busy doing the closed captioning. Or, or the whole the whole group. If there's anybody in the chat, uh, I see some great ideas here. Is there anyone in the chat that would like to jump on and share with us one example that surfaces in their classroom? This didn't exactly happen in my classroom. Um, for for a number of years, I was a museum educator. at the Franklin Institute in Philadelphia. And I distinctly remember times when classes came in and they, I guess they were mostly third grade to maybe fifth or sixth grade, maybe not much older than that. But they would have hands-on workshops in a designated space within the, the museum. And I specifically remember um, electricity workshops where students would first actually literally make a saltwater battery and test it with a light bulb. And then we would get them working with uh, circuits. And so many times, literally, I could see a light bulb with these students when they got their either series or parallel circuits to actually light a light bulb. Um, they actually connected all the wires to the to the little it was a very tiny light bulb, but and a, by then a, a battery, I think. But that that sense of accomplishment was was something that was Thank very nice. Thank you so nice much for sharing. Say. I love that you closed it off with that sense of accomplishment. And I think that really needs to be honored and recognized that inquiry really does not only present authentic and, and I would say more relevant learning experiences for our students, but the sense of engagement and achievement that they that they feel, I think, you know, that is a love for learning. And that is something that, you know, should be one of our, you know, kind of learning objectives of all of our lessons. And I know it can't happen every lesson or every day. But we do want our students to love learning, and we do want them to be excited about coming to class. And I hear other educators say, you know, if they're not running to my class in excitement to get there, I haven't done my job. And I couldn't agree more. I think that's the hallmark of fantastic teaching. Um, oh, I wanted to say one more piece with this. Um, oh, you mentioned, of course, the museum. And, and this is something we write about in Inquiry Mindset is how we could create partnerships in our community to have that authentic inquiry learning experience occur. And I think our museums are one of those amazing resources that we don't tap into nearly enough. Uh, you know, I think of our local museum. I think of, you know, districts I've visited and museums that those teachers have access to or cultural, uh, you know, locations and, and historical sites. It really is uh, something special, of course, when we get our students outside the walls of our classroom. And those uh, institutions, those, those resources, the museums, they're really looking for learners to come in and interact with the artifacts and with the exhibits. And I've seen really, really amazing things through the partnerships that, we, that we've created with museums. So I'm really thankful that you brought that up. I'm looking in the chat. There are some amazing resources here. I'm looking forward to going back into the archive of the chat and having a look at ideas here. Um, thank you so much for sharing. I'm looking at Gary's, wow, number six. Five, seven, nine. Uh, I love it. And you know, a part of what we're trying to do again is honor what we're doing in our practice and maybe consider where we could elevate our practice a little bit more, sharpen a couple of these items a bit more in a nice, safe, friendly, collegial way. We're having a nice little professional discourse about our inquiry practice. And I don't propose that these 10 happen in every lesson, but the inquiry classroom has these 10 occurring, uh, you know, week to week to week, which I think is really important to recognize. 
we'll transition into the next slide here. And this next slide really is the backbone of, of a lot of my work. Um, and I'm sure many of you have seen this sketch note uh, out and about. This is a sketch note with my co-author, Rebecca Bathurst Hunt. And uh, it proposes a scaffolded approach to inquiry where we help our students transition through these various types of inquiry in order to gain the skills and understandings needed when they, when, they, when they have more agency over learning. And that's the deep end of the swimming pool analogy here. Way over at the deep end in free inquiry, that's where students are choosing their own topic and they're choosing their own question. And we are really facilitators through the structures and the processes that we have uh, set up for our students in free inquiry. And then we were really differentiating for each and each and every one of our students that are in free inquiry. So in order to get to the free end of the swimming pool, we do need to scaffold and be uh, modelers of inquiry. I, I do believe we need to model inquiry ourselves. We are inquirers and they need to hear the questions that we ask and how we go about answering and deepening our understanding of these questions. Um, when I first adopted an inquiry approach to my practice, I thought it was free inquiry all the time. I spent a lot of my, my time, uh, I would say, more in traditional units of study. And then the free inquiry unit was one unit that happened towards the end of the year. And what I realized was that the two learning environments and experiences were so dissimilar that my students struggled with free inquiry because we were so teacher directed so much of the time throughout the rest of the year that when we got to free inquiry, although it was exciting, and it was inspiring. My students felt nervous and they felt anxious. And, and I felt nervous and anxious too because I knew I hadn't properly prepared them for the free inquiry end of the pool. So what I propose uh, in Dive and Inquiry, and Rebecca and I propose in Inquiry Mindset, is that we transition through these types together as a class. These are four units of study. Um, if you have your students September to June, these would be about two and a half months per unit of study. Um, sometimes I don't get the free inquiry with my students. Maybe it's because uh, they're younger and they're not quite ready for having that agency over learning. Maybe it's because we haven't ha had success in adopting the skills and understandings that students need in free inquiry. Sometimes I get to a type of inquiry and we do it and I realize we need to do it again. We need to be in this area of the pool a little bit longer uh, in order to have uh, us be successful in transitioning forward. Um, the hallmark of all of this is the essential question. In each type, we begin learning with an essential question. Um, I'll prompt you now in the chat as I continue to describe these types briefly before we transition is, you know, thinking of your experience with inquiry, what have you done? Looking at structure, looking at control, looking at guided, looking at free, uh, thinking of that unit of study, where would it fit in most nicely into one of these four types? Um, perhaps you have experience with free inquiry and you've done something where you've given your students that freedom uh, to choose their topics and to choose their question and their research pathways. Um, but perhaps maybe you've done something on the structured side uh, where you've been modeling the question and modeling the resources that you've pulled in to deepen our understanding of that question. So please in the chat, uh, looking at this slide, consider uh, sharing with us briefly uh, where you've had experience in inquiry. Um, as I continue to talk a bit more about this graphic be before we move on. Um, you know, I, I do think in the free end of the swimming pool that, you know, as we give our students more agency over learning, we do need to adopt clear structures and processes to help them be successful in free inquiry. Free inquiry is not free time, and I think that's a big, big misnomer. And a big fear of teachers thinking about adopting this approach into their practice is that it's too messy and students have too much control and although it is freeing for students, by no means is it free of structure or process. And I think that's really important for teachers to recognize is that in both books, uh, we propose what those structures are and we really clearly outline those processes so students and teachers feel more comfortable adopting free inquiry as their own. Um, you know, I, I do suggest that if free inquiry is your goal, you start over at the structured side of your pool first with your students to model inquiry and getting them used to the language and the different role of learning. You know, this is going to be quite different for our students than something that they've experienced in the past. And we need to honor that by being mindful of how we roll this out and intentional with our vocabulary. Um, you know, this is a graphic that hangs on the wall in my classroom. 
Uh, I refer to it often. You know, I'll point to it. I'll talk about the language. I will ask my students to reflect on our current unit of study and how we're moving forward into another unit of study, uh, another type of inquiry, and I'll ask them how they're feeling about it. I'll ask them to self-assess the skills and understandings that we've been focusing on to be successful in each type of inquiry. So, um, and also as a learning coach, this is great for teachers to push this out to your staff or to your team, not just to help them get a clearer understanding of the types of inquiry, but also to help them in their growth as inquirers themselves. Oftentimes I think action research or collaborative inquiry as a team or as a department or as a school can be really powerful and leveraged to honor our students and honor our learners. So uh, consider not just using this graphic with your kids, but also with your staff and with your teams to support them in building capacity and building an inquiry community. I think this can be used as a bit of a roadmap for, for staff and for teachers. Uh, and I think, like I said, just as it's relieving some of the nerves and, and anxieties around, uh, you know, free inquiry with our students, it can do the same thing for our teachers. Um, so I'll move on to the next big idea here, which is the power of a provocation. So more exclusive content uh, from the book you guys are seeing right now. This is a sketch note. Um, wow, I'm just looking at the chat. Holy goodness, amazing stuff going on in the chat. Thank you so much, folks. I wish I had time to be answering right there. This is amazing. And I appreciate the moderators for participating in the chat. This is fantastic. Um, the power of the provocation. Uh, this is a sketch note uh, from the book. This is a good chunk of the book we write about provocations. And provocations are meant to stir thought and wonder and, and curiosity and further questions from our students. Oftentimes, we'll start learning with a provocation and, and in turn, the questions that surface will determine the direction our inquiry unit goes, or at the very least, the first phase of research. The, the questions that are asked, that's what we need to answer right away. So provocations are, are images, they're videos, they're artifacts that we bring in to stir those questions and those curiosities and those passions from our students. All too often in my career, when I ask a student to do a passion project, you know, what are you passionate about? I've heard from many students that they're just not passionate about anything, and I can't fault them. I think passions require us to fall in love with something, and, and falling in love with something requires time and effort and sticking with it, you know, that grit, that growth mindset. That really helps us turn an idea or a question into a passion. And so for those students who perhaps don't have a passion, that's where provocations really support them and honor them because it sparks a wonder or it it helps us identify an interest that we could leverage into an inquiry opportunity with them. So I'd like to share with you a few provocations just to get the, uh, the engine running a bit. Uh, you know, this is actually an animated image, but here in, uh, in Blackboard, we, we can't show you the animation. But if you go to Google Images and you search volcanoes uh, and then go to um, the type uh, or the setting, sorry, and change the type of image to animated, that filters Google Images so you're only getting GIFs, these beautiful animated images. And these animated images, as we know, they're just looped images, like a, a looped video, very short video, but it's looped. So it's continuously playing the action we're seeing. Uh, so of course, the curricular topic here is volcanoes. Uh, at the younger years, this is something we would see in geography or social studies or even uh, 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 science, perhaps. And I love to show this volcano because our youngest students love to see the action. You know, the volcano explosion, explosion, uh, sorry, explodes in this animated image, the lava flows down the mountain, and then it repeats this action. And the questions that surface from our youngest learners are amazingly powerful. Um, you know, asking about, you know, of course, the whys, the whats, the hows. And that, again, identifies our first layer of research. That Those are the things we need to answer first. Uh, but then it also honors where their interests are, and it helps me better understand their interests and, and their wonderings. Uh, this is another animated image that I'll just describe it to you. Uh, off in the distance, the volcano explodes, and what's amazing about this is it actually sends this explosive sound wave through the sky, and you can see the sound wave. It actually pushes the clouds out further. And students love seeing this one because it's a very different perspective than the previous one. The previous one was a little dark, a little gloomy. 
definitely violent and hot, whereas this one is much more of an explosion. And it's a beautiful setting. You know, you're floating on this boat in the ocean, but the impact of the animation uh, really drives home the questions and the questions that surface from this curricular topic of volcanoes and this gift. It's really, really powerful. Uh, this is another GIF. Of course, I love to touch down on this one because this could be a social studies topic. You know, looking back at uh, an example of how volcanoes uh, impacted uh, a village or a community, and of course, it leads really well into archaeology and conversations around the, the science of archaeology. Um, and the questions that surface from this one, you can see how we're narrowing our focus through these provocations going from the broad idea of a, of a volcano exploding and now going to something more specific and even more specific with this provocation. Because of course here what you witness is there is some kind of uh, showcase here. There's some kind of museum where people are walking around and they're thinking of, you know, or our students are thinking of the why behind this. Why, how is this connected to the previous series of provocations? Um, here's another provocation I love to show with our, with our littles again maybe even up into uh, pre or middle school, sorry. Uh, of course, we're talking about germs here. We're talking about fungi. We're talking about bacteria. And these are all curricular topics in our science curriculum, uh, vocabulary that our students need to know. But I would throw this provocation up on there, just an image, and ask them, you know, what do you wonder? What do you notice? And what do you know? And those three questions really lead to some powerful, powerful observations. So what do you wonder? Like, what, what, what are you curious about here? Like I hear from students, oh, wh what's that blue coloring, that greeny blue coloring? Or what does control mean? What, what, what do the dirty hands do to the bread? Those are the wonderings that students uh, have with regards to this provocation. What do you notice? Those are our observations. Well, I notice that there are three different things and, and these three different types are showing uh, increasing impact on the bread. And then the what do you know, of course, this honors the students who actually know something about what's going on here. Uh, they could describe the science behind this reaction and this growth of the bacteria or the fungi. Um, and of course, we leave the what do you know till the end because we don't want those students who know something to destroy the wonderings of the students who don't know as much. And so we, we leave the what do you know question to the end of the provocation. So again, what do you wonder? What do you notice? What do you know? Absolutely great, great modification on the KWL there. Thanks for picking that up, Peggy. Um, this is another one that's an animated image that I love to use. And what we see here is the, the section on the left side of the GIF actually grows and expands. And when it hits the section on the right, the darker surface, it actually accelerates the growth of the bacteria. And so the questions here, and we use this with our senior level science students, the question is, well, what's the difference between the surface area and how come the surface area is impacting the growth of the bacteria? It is really a neat gift. And what I suggest you do is go to Google Image when you have some free time. Look at this. I'm assigning some homework. How fun. How teacher of me. Go to Google Image and search uh, uh, in animation. Search a curricular topic that you're going to do in the next few weeks with your students. Something that you have coming up in a lesson or a unit and search for an animated image and consider which animated images could be your provocation, your start point to uh, that unit of study or that learning experience. Um, again, provocations, they could be many things. Images, videos, some of my favorite videos, oh goodness, I love Kane's Arcade. Uh, if you haven't seen Kane's Arcade, it's a brilliant 11 minute video of a young boy who's passionate about creating cardboard arcade games. And I show that as a provocation because not only is it, you know, student passion or young person passion in action, but what it does is it provokes us to take on uh, doing something similar to Kane, maybe creating our own Kane's Arcade as a school or as a class. And I've seen schools do this. They show Kane's Arcade as a provocation, and then students plan a school-wide event or a class-wide event I've seen classes do STEM projects with Kane's Arcade where they showcase their, their arcade, their cardboard arcade uh, at parent-teacher night. And parents come in, <clears throat> excuse me, with their children and they play the arcade games as a fundraiser for maybe a year-end trip or year-end field trip. Uh, Kane's Arcade is one of my favorites. Um, you know, I've got a number of other ones for senior level science and math. Uh, please go check out Abu's story. So Abu, I'll spell it in the chat. 
and you could um, and you could Google this or YouTube this right away. Abu's story is a fantastic video about the power of uh, the young person, the young people we work with when they identify a problem in society and try to use technology to solve that problem. And Abu is an amazing student, uh, and as you'll see, he's brilliant, he's intelligent, he's he's an innovator, and we all have an Abu in our classrooms. And that's where that provocation really strikes a nerve with some of our students when they recognize that, oh my goodness, this teacher is showing this provocation, and it, it it's for me. This is something I could do in my inquiry uh, uh, unit. And and so provocations. Sometimes they begin units of study. Sometimes they inspire students uh, to take on an inquiry topic as their own. So Abu's story and Kane's Arcade are two of my favorite videos. Uh, I just want to share with you this slide briefly. This is, again, more exclusive content from Inquiry Mindset. Um, I don't know if there are any teacher librarians with us today, but I love collaborating with our teacher librarian. And we actually write about the power of the teacher librarian and media specialist in the book for a good chunk because we really want to drive teachers who are interested in more powerfully using inquiry in their practice to their teacher librarian for that collaboration because they really have their hands on so many resources and so many uh, artifacts um, and, and tools to support inquiry in the classroom. So what we do is we break down these eight points that uh, teacher librarians can offer as support or help for the classroom teacher. And then we break down what each of these points actually looks like. So what does scaffolding research to nurture strong research skills look like? And how can you partner up with your teacher librarian to have that happen? How can you design a learning space with inquiry in mind? What does a, a learning space look like that honors inquiry-based learning? Um, so teacher librarians, if you're in the chat, you know, huge shout out to you. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm looking forward to tweeting this out in the near future. We haven't shared this to the broader community. And what I aim to do here is uh, when we tweet this out eventually, when the book is released, is, you know, please celebrate your teacher librarians by giving them a shout out or some thanks for their support for you and, and in adopting inquiry as your own. Um, we're going to finish off here in the last 10 minutes of our webinar together with the four pillars of inquiry. Uh, and I'm definitely going to prompt you uh, to, to share in this graphic, um, you know, your thoughts on, on one of these four pillars. And specifically, where, where would your inquiry experience uh, filter into one of these four pillars? And so I'll explain them to you briefly. And again, we go into depth in both books, Dive in Inquiry and Inquiry Mindset, as to how we use these in our classroom. Um, but these are essentially start points to inquiry. We want uh, our inquiry units and experiences to start with one of these four. And underlying all of these, of course, are the curricular expectations and the prescribed learning outcomes that we are asked to make sure our students are grappling with and experiencing and, and eventually we're, we're assessing. But we can tie these four pillars uh, to those curricular standards really, really beautifully and powerfully. Um, so <clears throat> the first one is explore passion. And of course, we've all had passion projects in our pra practice, whether they're genius hour or inquiry units themselves. Uh, you know, students who have passions, again, they've stuck with something long term. They've stuck through the trials and tribulations of having it turned into something that they love. Uh, so exploring a passion is leveraging that passion and, and making it your inquiry unit. So I've had, you know, passionate athletes, uh, you know, explore and share their expertise and their understanding and then research it further and then share it with, uh, with a broader audience. Um, so explore passion is just that, you know, I've had artists explore their passion, I've had musicians explore their passion, but as I said earlier, a lot of students perhaps don't have a passion. And so that's where these other three pillars really support those students. Uh, the second pillar, aim for a goal. I work with many students who are extremely goal oriented and focused, and I want to leverage that goal and have it be a learning uh, opportunity for our students. So an example would be in my senior classes, I have many students who have goals about post-secondary, higher ed, university programs, et cetera, and we pull those in to the inquiry unit and we have them be a learning experience for our students. So whether it's getting their application together, doing research into their program, sharing out the why behind their goal, 
Uh, maybe it's, um, uh, you know, actually visiting a campus. Oh, I love sending students to our local university campus as part of their inquiry unit because it brings the goal to life and it helps it be tangible and attainable. Um, the third pillar is uh, to delve into curiosities. I firmly believe all of our students have at least a wondering or at least a curiosity that when given the support and space in school to explore further, it could very well turn into a passion. And so I love asking my students just that simple question, you know, what's a wondering, what's a curiosity? And that's where the provocations really come into play in terms of planting seeds to curiosity. Throughout the year as I show them provocations, eventually one provocation is going to be a curiosity for every single student in my class. And so that's really where uh, provocations can support this pillar of inquiry. And then last, take on a new challenge. Sometimes I have students who just want to do something that they've never done before, and that's where this pillar really comes into play. Um, taking on a new challenge looks like, you know, maybe a student wants to pick up a guitar, and, and they've never been a musical or picked up a musical instrument, uh, but they, have, they, they want to take on that new challenge as their inquiry unit. Last year I had a student who wanted to learn sign language. Do they have a future in that field? No. Do they have a passion for sign? Have they been personally touched by someone who uses sign? No, but this was a challenge that they wanted to take on. So from these four pillars and thinking of your inquiry experience, uh, you know, please share in the chat as I see you have been, whereabouts uh, inquiry would fit into one of these four pillars. And then also, you know, I could easily scroll back through the chat or maybe Peggy, if you don't mind coming on the mic, and paraphrasing a question for us in case I miss them, rather than me frantically scrolling up and finding a question based on not just the four pillars, but anything that surfaced throughout our chat. Is that possible, Peggy? I did capture some questions. Thank you. Um, is free inquiry similar to Genius Hour? Yeah, absolutely. That's a great question. It, it is absolutely similar. Um, I think in Genius Hour, we're giving our students that, that space and that time to explore curiosity or wondering. Just as in free inquiry, Genius Hour has structures and processes that we ask our students to, you know, work within. Um, I think the big difference between Genius Hour and, and free inquiry in my model and what I propose is that Genius Hour tends to uh, be that drop in the bucket Friday afternoon experience. And this isn't a knock on anybody who does uh, Genius Hour. I think it's a great start point to what I propose. But it definitely reflects those, those tensions I felt early on in my practice as an inquiry teacher in that it was so dissimilar to everything else that my students were experiencing in the classroom that it created some nerves, some anxieties, and, and undeniably I didn't best prepare them for Genius Hour. So what I really try to do is marry or find the balance between uh, the content and the curriculum and design it in a way, structure it in a way where it is inquiry, it's just more of a teacher modeled inquiry. So when we get to Genius Hour or free inquiry, my students are more familiar with the language and their new role in learning. Um, so that's a great question, Peggy. Another question? Yes. Uh, do you think there's a difference between explore and discover? Oh, that's a great question, yeah. I do, I, I think there is a difference. I think, um, I think exploration uh, kind of has a connotation for me, not a negative connotation through any means, but exploration kind of gives me the impression that there's an ecosystem that I've created or there's, there's a, a, some confinement to the exploration that I've created where discovery kind of rings true to the free inquiry where uh, really there's a lot more freedom and the discoveries that students are experiencing perhaps are outside of the ecosystem that I've created. Okay. Thanks, Marilyn. Yeah, I'm glad that you showed them that sign language video. I, I pushed Marilyn. Marilyn's doing some amazing things with her students right now, and she's blogging about it. I saw earlier that she shared the, the, the blog URL, uh, and so I've shared some resources from my classroom with uh, Marilyn to share with her classroom just to model a little bit about what inquiry looks like. Mm -hmm. I think that just goes to show the power of collaboration amongst us all is when we are sharing I think uh, those artifacts that could really, you know, empower our students in understanding what inquiry could look like for them. Any other questions that have surfaced, Peggy? Yes, there are some others. Um, how would you schedule this in your class? Specifically, how much time and how many days per week? 
Yeah, so for me, uh, you know, I, I do propose uh, this is this is every class every day, September to June. But what I mean by that is through the types of inquiry, the, the, the structured to the controlled to the guided to the free, you know, I, I'm still teaching uh, the content in the curriculum that I have always taught. I've just reframed it to begin with a question and have more voice and choice. And then eventually the student in free inquiry takes on a much more significant and meaningful role, unlike anything else that I've done previously as, as an inquiry teacher, or as, sorry, I should say as a traditional teacher. Uh, and, and that last capstone unit, that free inquiry unit, that ends up being about a quarter of our course. So I leave it until the very end of the year. Uh, so it's about two months or two and a half months where they are in that process together. And we describe that process in both books pretty clearly as to what, how it goes day to day, week to week, and how you scaffold the structures and the processes that the students are working within to best support them uh, in, in that time. So again, inquiry for me is more of a holistic process and, and approach to learning. It isn't the Friday afternoon or an hour here or half an hour there. It really is reframing our pedagogy and what learning looks like to begin with a question and slowly scaffold to having our students take on a more meaningful and, and authentic role in learning. Okay. These are great questions, Peggy. Thank you for, for uh, digging them up for us from the chat. Are there other ones that have surfaced that you can bring up? This is similar. Yeah. Um, but added to, added, I'm sorry, added to, added to the time allowed, um, how do you match what you do to standards? Yeah, that's a great question. So um, how do I match what I do to standards? Well, standards are woven throughout everything I do. Standards and inquiry don't get tossed out the window. Uh, nor should they. I think the content and the standards, we need to grapple with those and unpack those first before we can go to deep learning. And, and in order for our students to understand what deep learning looks like and feels like, they need to have the content down first. They need to have the vocabulary and the jargon of whatever curricular topic or standard uh, we are working with. And so, you know, inquire for me is not, you know, throwing the content out the window. It's knowing when to transition from content and when to not let content drive learning and when to transition from content to more deeper exploration. I think that's, that shouldn't be a nuanced understanding. That shouldn't be a nebulous, you know, understanding of when to transition. I think we're very much object or, or observing our students in learning and we are always assessing, aren't we? We're always watching, looking in their eyes, taking in evidence, and then we're assessing on when we're ready to move further. So I think that the standards and the curriculum, it's tied to everything I do. Um, and then in free inquiry specifically, I, and this is something we unpack in the book, we really do ask our students to make sure that free inquiry has a space in our particular classroom. So if it's a senior level physics class, the free inquiry unit has to fit in that physics class. It can't be something that isn't grade level or discipline subject appropriate. Uh, and that really helps us make sure that the standards in the curricular pieces are touched down on in all four types of inquiry. That's a powerful question. Okay, what kinds of assessment do you do? Yeah, my assessment, I, I believe in, and this, this is, uh, I don't think this is a big idea or outside of anyone's uh, kind of zone of experience with assessment. Um, I, I do believe in a split screen of assessment. And what I, what I mean by that is on one side of the screen we have what we want our students to understand. And I map out what I want my students to understand throughout our learning journey together. And these are those big ideas. These are those conceptual understandings. And I shouldn't have 20 or 30 big ideas mapped out throughout my school year. I should have a handful, maybe five or six or seven conceptual understandings. And so once I identify what I want them to understand, then I choose my assessment tools based on those understandings. Then on the other side of the split screen, that, that's the skill side, that's the to-do side. So maybe I want my students to be able to write a five-paragraph essay. Or maybe I want my students to be able to uh, experiment and, and use the scientific method. And so once I've identified what I want my students to do, what tools I want them to be able to hone and sharpen, then I choose my assessment tools for those as well. So my assessment tools, uh, you know, 
once I've mapped out my split screen of assessment, then I begin to map out what assessment tools I use to best uh, assess those two pieces of the split screen. A lot of my assessment tools are, are school-wide. You know, those are tools that we've agreed upon as a department or as a school or as a district. Um, so this isn't anything outside of, you know, the realm of what other teachers in my building are doing. Yeah. Okay. Those were the questions that I was able to gather so far. Fantastic. Fantastic. So if anyone else has a question for Trevor, please type in the chat. Yeah, please do so, folks. I encourage you, you know, our, our time is almost up, so this will be how we finish up in this Q&A. Um, and of course, the learning doesn't end here, so if there's a question that surfaces after the webinar in the future, please reach out to me via Twitter or by email or my contact page on my website. Um, but please do, uh, if you have a question now, toss it in the chat and we can continue the conversation right now. Wow, I'm just looking back at the chat, Peggy. It's unbelievable how much participation has occurred there. Thank you so much, everyone, for sharing. Inquiry mindset, you know, I, I was asked recently, I'll just speak briefly and so I, and to give people a chance to ask uh, a question. Or I'm just looking back at the chat. Yeah. Great, great, great. Thank you, folks. Um, inquiry mindset, I was asked recently, you know, if I could speak to the title of the book and, and why we chose that title. And what I've come to understand is that the, the most important factor in adopting inquiry in the classroom, it's not the structures, it's not the processes, it really comes down to the teacher in the room. And, and it, the teacher in the room is going to have the greatest influence on the students in inquiry together. And so what we want to do in the book, what we propose to do in the book, and what we would like teachers to consider is what that mindset looks like and what it sounds like and how we can model that mindset for our youngest learners. So the book is full of these examples of, of you know, the, the, the language we use in inquiry, the language we use with our students, uh, as well as the artifacts and the lessons and the processes we follow and, and finding the balance between the two. It can't just be about uh, the four pillars or it can't just be about the types of inquiry. It really, uh, inquiry mindset is about creating that mindset with or honoring that mindset of the teacher, but also creating that mindset with our learners. Thank you so much. I don't see any questions surfacing here yet. We'll give it another minute or so. I apologize for the beeping. I'm going to turn my notifications off there. So many resources being shared here, folks. And I do encourage you in the future to reach out uh, if you have questions or if something's uh, surfaced in the coming days or weeks. Reach out to me. The, the learning doesn't end here. Great, great, great. So, you know, my last slides, uh, I'll, I'll just zoom towards the end because uh, these last slides were, are really great talking points and we don't have enough time to go through them, but these are all artifacts from my travels and from my consulting, from my coaching of how or what inquiry classrooms look like and how teachers can do certain things with the design of their room to honor the questions and the, the curiosities and the wonders of our learners. Um, and we write about all of these in inquiry mindset. So forgive me for zooming through those. Uh, this is the free inquiry proposal. This is the six, uh, the six point checklist that we ask all of our students to complete in order to have the agency over learning in free inquiry. So it's an example of the structures and processes we ask our students to uh, wonder in uh, for free inquiry. Uh, and lastly, this is the inquiry process. This is a, a neat roadmap for our students to follow uh, and understand that it's going to be an adventure. And together on this adventure, uh, the teacher is going to support students and the teacher always has their back and that together we will get to the public display of understanding that peak of, of, of the mountain in, of inquiry later on in learning. Um, so we'll finish off here uh, just with my last slide, which was my first slide. Uh, just my contact info again, folks, please reach out. Uh, you know, trevormckenzie.com is full of resources. I'm always tweeting out what, what colleagues are sharing around how it's going in their classroom with regards to inquiry and, and what artifacts and, and what, what it looks like in their classroom. So find me on Twitter and I'd be more than happy to follow you back. 
uh, and, and you'll be able to see what other teachers are doing in inquiry. Peggy, I want to thank you and, and the panel here for hosting me and for being so supportive and making this webinar run so smoothly. Thank you so much to you all. Thanks so much, Trevor, and thank you for your very informative presentation. We already dealt with the questions, so I'll turn the mic over to Peggy, who will tell us what's coming up next. Thank you so much, Trevor. I knew we would leave it excited and inspired, and I definitely am. And I'm so glad we have so many other resources in the Live Binder so people can watch some of those great videos that are there, um, and that will inspire them even more. We have some great shows coming up, and next week, next Saturday, Heather Moser is going to going to be with us, and she's going to be talking about enhancing relationships through modern technology tools. And on March 10th, <coughs> excuse me, Jolie Boucher is going to be talking about hyperdocs and ways you can differentiate instruction with hyperdocs in the elementary classroom. March 17th, Meredith Akers, who is an elementary assistant principal, is going to do a special show that's going to focus on tech tools for leaders. It's going to be great to have an administrator present for us. March 24th, Paula Fellinger is going to be our feature teacher, and she teaches in second grade. Looking forward to that. And on March 31st, we won't have a show because that's Easter weekend in the United States. So I hope you'll join us every Saturday that you can and check out our recordings if you can. Join the live shows. Thanks, Peggy. The Learning Revolution Project is Steve Hargadon's latest. He's gathered all his PD resources in one place, including host your own webinar, where you can sign up for a Blackboard Collaborate session. And it's free as long as it's open to the public. You can nominate a featured teacher at this link or from within the Live Finder. You can nominate yourself as a featured teacher for the month. The video collection is on iTunes U. Again, this link is accessible in the Live Finder. There's also a Classroom 2.0 Live YouTube channel, so the videos are there as well. As you exit the session, the survey should open in your browser. You can also take the survey link from the chat box, or you can get it from the Live Binder. At the bottom of that survey, you can request a professional development certificate, prints out with your name, and thanks to Patty Ruffing for not only that and sending them out. Please make sure, though, that the email address that you request this to be sent to is a personal email address, not a school email address. Schools tend to block these from getting to you. Special thanks to our special guest, Trevor McKenzie, to Steve Hargadon, the founder of Classroom 2.0, Future of Education and the Learning Revolution, to Blackboard Collaborate for our webinar platform, and to everyone who participated in this show today. Thanks so much for, for coming. <laughs>